In this lecture, we'll be doing an independent samples test for two variances. If we want to compare two populations, sometimes we're interested in differences between their variances. In general, as human beings, we don't like things with high variance, though maybe we don't use that terminology to express our disgust when the highly variable city bus shows up at different times every day. Some examples of when you might be interested in variances. Is one stock significantly less volatile than another? Is one mode of transportation more consistent in its arrival times? Does one professional athlete perform more consistently than another? Let's look at an example problem. We wish to test at the 5% level of significance if Yahoo and Google stocks differ significantly in their day-to-day -day variance of percent gains. This may be of interest because perhaps we want to invest in a stock that won't give us a myocardial infarction. A sample of 31 days from each stock returned a daily sample variance of 0.0087% squared for Google and 0.0132% squared for Yahoo. Our hypothesis then will be that the two variances, the two population variances, are equal in the null hypothesis. Recall that the null hypothesis is always the boring hypothesis that says nothing is different. Our researcher's hypothesis is that there is a difference between the variances. And if we can find a statistically significant difference, we may choose to invest in the stock that is less variable. In steps two and three, we gather our data and perform the critical value method, where we find the test statistic and critical value. Here we see that the two sample variances are as reported. We convert those into decimals so we can enter them into our calculator. The sample sizes for both were 31. I said the samples came from 31 days of observations. And thus we have two degrees of freedom for this test, one for the first sample and one for the second sample. Those degrees of freedom are always the sample sizes minus one. In the critical valued approach, the test statistic is one of the easiest test statistics we'll ever calculate. Here we take the larger of the two sample variances, which was Yahoo's in this case, and divide by the smaller of the two sample variances. So we're dividing Yahoo's sample variance by Google's sample variance. Always put the larger one in the numerator so that you can use the F tables in your textbook. In this case, our test statistic is 1.52. The critical value here will be 2.07 at the 5% level of significance. Now I will show you where that number comes from in an F table. F tables are easily the most complicated of the statistical tables for an introductory class. With an F table, you have two sets of degrees of freedom like we talked about in step two. You have a numerator degrees of freedom, which is along the top here, and you have a denominator degrees of freedom, which is along the side. In our particular test, both the numerator and denominator had 30 degrees of freedom. So if we adjust this so we can see it, here we see 30 degrees of freedom in the numerator. We come down to 30 degrees of freedom in the denominator. And that number is 2.07. That's where I got my critical value. Another thing to notice is that every page of an F table has its own significance level, its own alpha. Since this test was a 5% level test with two tails or two sides to the test, we divide the 5% into two pieces and we use the F table with an alpha of 0.025. If this were a one-tailed test where I was testing if Yahoo stock, for instance, was more variable than Google stock, I would go to the 5% alpha because I would be doing a one-tailed 5% test. So you have to pick the correct F table that matches your particular level of significance for your one-sided or two-sided test. When we make our decision, we use the test statistic and critical value to determine if there's enough information to reject the null hypothesis. Notice that in this test, the test statistic is a ratio of two variances. And if that ratio is close to one, then the two variances are similar. Let's return back to our hypotheses for just a moment to take a look and see that saying that two variances are different is the same as saying that the ratio of the two variances is not equal to one. Algebraically, we would divide both sides of the inequality by the sigma squared y, 
so that we get sigma squared g over sigma squared y is not equal to 1. Here we cannot reject the null hypothesis because our test statistic of 1.52 is not farther from 1 than the critical value of 2.07. In other words, the test statistic did not provide enough extreme evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Thus, we say there is not sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance to claim that the variance of Google stock differs from that of Yahoo stock. Let's do another example problem. An unnamed source of sports analysis, we'll call it ESPN for now, suggests that one player, Bob, is not nearly as consistent as another player, Joe. They're saying that Joe is a more consistent player and thus is a more valuable member of his team, perhaps a more reliable asset to his team. An index of performance was measured each game for both players over a span of 21 games. Bob's sample standard deviation was 12.5 and Joe's sample standard deviation was 11.9. Note here that I haven't given you the sample variances, but rather the sample standard deviations. We'll have to adjust these for our test statistic later. Though Joe did indeed have a slightly lower standard deviation, the sample size is small, and the difference may be due to randomness rather than differences in actual ability. This is what a hypothesis test is for, to protect us against coming to conclusions too quickly on small sample sizes. Test at the 5% level of significance to see if Joe's standard deviation of performance is less than that of Bob. That is, test to see if Joe is significantly more consistent. Thus, in our researcher's hypothesis, we're testing to see if Joe's standard deviation, Joe's sigma, is less than Bob's sigma. And again, I could rewrite that as a ratio. Is the ratio of Joe's sigma to Bob's sigma less than 1? Here I want to point out that the hypotheses are the exact same if we use population variances. Saying that Joe's sigma is less than Bob's sigma, or Bob's population standard deviation, is the same thing as saying that Joe's variance is less than Bob's variance. They are synonymous statements, so it doesn't really matter which one you say in the hypotheses. In step two, let's gather the important information. We saw that Joe's sample standard deviation was 11.9, and thus his sample variance is 11.9 squared, or 141.61, on a sample size of 21 with 20 degrees of freedom. Bob's sample standard deviation was 12.5, which leads to a sample variance of 12.5 squared, or 156.25. He also had 20 degrees of freedom on a sample size of 21. Remember that our test statistic is a ratio of the two sample variances, and we always put the larger variance on top. So here we're putting Bob's variance on top of Joe's. We divide and we get about 1.1. The critical value here will be 2.12. This value will come from the 5% F table, alpha equals 0 0.05, because we're doing a one-tailed 5% level test. There's no reason to divide alpha into two parts. It will come from the 20th row and the 20th column for 20 numerator degrees of freedom and 20 denominator degrees of freedom. Note that oftentimes these two numbers will actually be different and you'll have to keep track of which sample size led to your numerator and which sample size led to your denominator so you can determine the degrees of freedom for numerator and denominator. Make sure that you can find 2.12 in your F table and see where it comes from. Remember, if the F statistic is close to 1, then the variances are very similar. We, in this case, we cannot reject the null hypothesis because the test statistic of 1.1 is closer to 1 than the critical value of 2.12. Think of it like this. The null hypothesis lives at 1 in these tests. If you get a sample variance ratio of 1, then you're supporting the null hypothesis. We're trying to reject the null hypothesis. So we want the test statistic to be far from 1. But if the test statistic is too close to 1, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. Your interpretation here is that there is not sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance to claim that Joe is more consistent than Bob. That is, that Joe has a lower standard deviation. This may be a result of randomness and small sample sizes. Now we come to my favorite part of the class, story time. In Major League Baseball, a player may enter what is called arbitration before his fourth, fifth, and sixth seasons in the league. 
In arbitration, the player and his team go to court to settle a contract dispute over his next year's salary. In 1991, ba Baltimore Orioles pitcher Bob Malacky disagreed with his team about his salary, and thus they went to court. They went into arbitration. The Orioles lawyer presented the arbitrator, essentially a judge, with Malacky's game scores for each one of his starts during the past season. Here's what ensued, as accounted by Alan Schwartz in the book The Numbers Game, on page 150. Quote, the crescendo came when the Orioles tried to prove that Malacky was inconsistent, a real bugaboo among baseball folks. To do this, they trotted out a statistic called game score, which boiled down to a pitcher's entire performance in each game into one easy-to-access number, and showed how Malacky varied wildly up and down. In other words, from game to game, his game scores were very different. Murmurs around the room suggested that Baltimore had scored a key point here. Remember, Baltimore doesn't want to pay him a lot of money, so they want to show that he's not that great. The problem was this. Game score had been invented by none other than Bill James, who was sitting right there on the Malaki side. Bill James was an advisor to Malaki's lawyer. James just happened to have handy the game scores for Roger Clemens, the best pitcher in the league, and showed the arbitrator how even the game's greats could be inconsistent too. In all likelihood, in this case, Bill James showed that the standard deviation of game scores for each of the pitchers was very similar. The Orioles were dead. Malaki won the case thanks to James' at-the-ready game score sheets. Thus, a simple comparison of game-by-game -game standard deviations showed us how little most people understand about variability and how statistics can help reveal the truth in many disputes. Let's learn how to do this on the calculator. To perform a two-sample test for variances, remember that we're using an F distribution in F tables. So we want to go into Stat, Tests, and scroll all the way down to our two-sample F test here at option E. The two-sample F test from statistics does not require a lot of inputs. First, we enter the sample standard deviation of the first observation, the one that's larger, 12.5. The sample size here was 21. We enter the second sample standard deviation, the smaller one, of 11.9. And remember, the calculator wants the sample standard deviations here. If you put in the variances, the test will be wrong. We also had a sample size of 21 for the second sample. And here we were trying to show that the first pitcher, Bob, was more volatile than the second pitcher, Joe. So I'm going to do a greater than test. When I calculate, you'll notice a test statistic you should recognize. It's about 1.1. Here the p-value of 41.4% suggests that we cannot reject the null hypothesis, which is the same conclusion to which we came when we did it by hand.